So we found that the parasitic structures that form net shop cannot be turned on. In fact, this is false and it is very misleading. So by the end of the last video, we dis uh, discovered that we have uh, three PN junctions. One PN junction is formed between the P plus of the source and uh, the end type of the substrate. Another PN junction is formed between the uh, substrate and the well. A third PN junction is formed, is formed between uh, the uh, uh, well and the source. And therefore, uh, when we look at these PN junctions, the connection between ground and supply includes three PN junctions connected in such a manner. These three PN junctions can never be turned on simultaneously. Uh, if you try to turn on J1 and J3, which you probably can with VDD being applied to the top, J2 will not turn on. If you exchange ground and VDD, J2 might turn on, but J3 and J1 will never turn on. But this structure is actually called a silicon controlled rectifier. And the structure of the uh, two bipolars connected in such a way is a latch structure. And this latch structure truly has a steady state where no current flows through it and where it is completely harmless. But there is a, um, a transient condition in which current can flow somewhere in the circuit. And the problem with the circuit is that once current finds a way to flow through it, it will continue to magnify and it will continue to flow indefinitely until either the circuit is turned off or it is destroyed. The two factors we are missing when we assume the latch shop structure cannot uh, turn on are the presence of drains in the uh, transistors and also the presence of transient currents. So if we look at the drains, the drains form second emitters for both the PNP and the NPN structure. And so we have these drains forming a, a second emitter. And if you imagine that this was part of a CMOS uh, inverter, then it is true that the source and the, drain, and the source of the NMOS and the source of the PMOS are connected to supply and ground respectively. And so we can assume that this is connected to uh, supply and that this is connected to ground. However, the drains are not connected to anything in particular. In fact, the drains are kind of floating if both the NMOS and the PMOS transistors are cut off. And therefore, um, there's something of an unknown voltage at the drains. Now, let's think of what happens when we turn on the circuit, when we first turn it on. So, when we first turn on the circuit, there are capacitors everywhere, and these capacitors need to charge and discharge. Uh, I'm not just talking about output mode capacitors, I'm talking about internal mode capacitors, and even capacitances at the supply and ground planes. And so, there are capacitances at every node that need to power up. When, once these capacitances have um, all achieved their steady state value, the circuit can start to work properly. This is the turn, in, turn on process. Now, when, if you imagine that we have you know, billions of gates turning on, this causes a, a very large current to be drawn and sourced to the supply and ground pins of the chip. So at turn on, we see a huge current flowing, which is responsible for charging and discharging all the capacitances within the circuit, getting them to the correct voltage. And this includes even supply and power, which we usually uh, assume to be constant. And uh, this huge current is a transient because it only flows in the beginning when we first talk, turn on the circuit. So now look at the, um, at the NPN transistor, for example. Um, the only way for this NPN transistor to turn on is if this node is higher than this node by at least uh, 0.7 volts. So if the base is higher than the emitter by 0.7 volts, it will turn on. But the base is going to be at ground and the emitter is going to be at ground. So there's no way for it to turn on. Except that there is a second emitter now. And that second emitter is the drain. And the drain is floating. It's independent from the ground, 
it is true that the source and the base of the NPN transistor, the source of the NMOS and the base of the NPN transistor are both grounded, but the drain is not. And so this second emitter is unknown. It has an unknown voltage. It could be at ground, it could be at VDD, it could be anywhere in between, and it's equally likely to be anywhere in between. But it's very likely that it is at zero volt, actually, if the circuit has been turned off for a very long time. You know, charges will leak. So it's very likely that it is at zero volt. So this could ostensibly be at zero volt, which is still fine because it means that the BGT will not turn on because the base is also at zero volt. Unless, unless, unless this ground is not actually at zero volt. So if this ground is higher than zero volt, then that means that through the drop over RS, this will be even higher than zero uh, than, than zero volt and we will have enough voltage to turn on the base to second emitter junction so why would this ground not be zero volt well when we first turn on the transistor the the chip we have a large current flowing and this current will lead to a voltage drop over the ground uh, wires and so all the way up to the gate we are looking at it's very possible it's actually uh, almost guaranteed that the voltage we see here for ground does not equal zero volt, at least until we have managed to, uh, to charge up the ground plane. And so this ground is going to bounce up, this supply is going to drop down, and we also have a drop over RS and a drop over RW, which could turn on either this junction or this junction. Once that happens, we are in trouble. Why is it that we are in trouble? Okay, so let's go through uh, the sequence. What happens is that the ground bounces. This emitter could possibly be at zero volt. There's a drop over RS. This base will be higher than this emitter by more than 0.7 volts, turning on this junction, causing this NPN transistor to be in active region or even in saturation region, doesn't really matter. But once this bipolar transistor turns on, we are in trouble. Why? Because a collector current will flow. This collector current could be um, a smaller portion of the emitter current than we are used to with, uh, with good bipolar transistors, because again, these are lateral bipolar transistors, which, are not, which have, don't have good properties, but it is still a collector current. What's going to happen next is uh, that most of this current will flow through the base of the PNP transistor, because this current has two ways to go. It could either be sourced from RW or from the base of the PMOS. Now, if RW is large, then most of the current will go to the base of the PNP transistor. In that case, the PNP transistor sees a base current. What it's going to do is it's going to multiply this base current by beta, and it's going to pass a much larger collector, collector current. This collector current is either going to go to ground or it's going to go into the base of the NPN. Most of it will prefer to go to the base of the NPN because RS is large, which will be multiplied to produce an even larger collector current, which flows into the PNP, which gets multiplied. And so we have a positive feedback loop in which the two collector currents keep reinforcing each other. And we effectively have a current passing from supply to ground. The problem with this structure is that once a current flows anywhere, current will continue to flow, whether or not the transients have passed, whether or not ground has stopped to bounce, whether or not the drains are still at ground, current will continue to flow in these bipolar structures and it will be huge and it will cause the circuit to fail. In the best case, the circuit will not function properly, we will have to turn it off. Once we turn it off, latch up will stop, but it will repeat again once we turn it on if we repeat the same conditions. Uh, on the other hand, there's also a possibility that once we turn on the circuit, the current will be so large that it destroys it. So latch up is extremely dangerous. So how do we solve latch up? We solve latch up mainly by reducing the values of RS and RW. If we do that, we 
encourage most of the current to flow into RS and RW instead of into the bases of the bipolar transistors. This prevents the positive feedback loop from having again more than one and causes the feedback current to dampen and fall down. How do we decrease RS and RW? Mainly by increasing the number of, uh, of ground and supply contacts in the wells. Uh, theoretically, you should only have one uh, contact per well and one contact per substrate, but we should actually increase the number. Uh, some design rules even stipulate that we uh, should use one contact per transistor. So there should be one P plus contact per PMOS transistor, uh, one N plus contact per PMOS transistor, and one P plus contact per NMOS transistor. The other way we could uh, prevent latch up is by reducing transient current. If we reduce transient current, we reduce the amount of uh, bounce of ground and supply. And we can reduce transient current, for example, by turning on the circuit uh, a section at a time. So we can like turn on this module, then this module, then this module. It will take longer to turn on the circuit, but it's a one time event and it reduces the total current at any one instance that is flowing into the supply or ground pins. But the most important, most effective way to uh, prevent latch up is to actually isolate transistors from each other, specifically isolate um, PMOS transistors from NMOS transistors. And so if you imagine that there's something isolating these two transistors from each other, it will cut the, um, the feedback path between them. It would effectively make beta equal zero for the, uh, for, the, for the bipolar transistors and will remove the latch up structure. So the best way to prevent latch up is to prevent the formation of bipolar transistors that can support the positive feedback.